Hey, welcome to Oriente, the new voice of brotherhood. I am your host, uh, Eric Diamond, and uh, I have a special guest host. While Jason Van Dyke is away in uh, Europe, I think he's coming back pretty soon. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to Juan Sepulveda. Uh, Juan is, uh, gosh, Juan, you are a host of the Masonic Roundtable. You are host of the Winding Stairs uh, Masonic Podcast. Um, you are a creator of the Gentleman's Brotherhood. You are an artist. You're a father. Uh, you are a busy man, sir. I'm a lazy bum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for having me on your show. It is uh it's a very, very, it's a great privilege for me. Oh, thank you. Thanks. That's very, very kind of you to say. Um, so, uh, so I'm a big fan of TMR and, uh, um, and of the winding stairs. And, but today I wanted to talk to you about something that you've created called practical masonry. And I've, I've wanted to do a show on practical masonry, not like the Juan Sepulveda brand of practical masonry, but just sort of practical masonry in general. But when I saw that you had created something called practical masonry, I was like, Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Let's, uh, let's, let's get more into that. But before we do a uh, little bit of housekeeping, I, first I want to, uh, a shout out to our, one of our newer executive producers, uh, Brent Webb. He is the lodge education officer at Hagerstown lodge number, uh, 217 in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, hi Brent. And, um, Brent uh, wrote me a very nice, uh, uh, email, uh, gave me some good feedback and, um, uh, and, uh, is going to be using some of, uh, some of the back episodes of Ex Oriente, uh, to, um, uh, as, as part of a lodge education program. And if you'd like to use, uh, some of the stuff that we've, that we've, uh, published here on Ex Oriente as part of your lodge education program, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to do it. Just, just let us know beforehand. And we like to know kind of like, you know, what you're using it for and where you are and, and, uh, and, uh, how you're going to use it. So it's just so we, we know what, what's, uh, what's going on, but, um, yeah, just, just feel free to uh, drop us a line at, uh, exoriente at gmail.com. Um, and then I also want to do a shout out to, uh, Steve McClune, um, from, uh, the real down under. That's what he, he calls this is the real down under, which is, of course, New Zealand, uh, which I didn't know, um, which makes, I guess, off Australia, the fake down under. Um, but uh, but if that's the real I see now, I always thought that New Zealand was Middle Earth. Um, but uh, but if it is the real down under, uh, uh, Steve McLoon is there and uh, we say hello. Uh, greetings from uh, 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 palatial. um Ex Oriente Plaza in Skokie, Illinois. Um, all right, so, so Juan, so you're you're a you're a busy Masonic guy. Before we get into the practical masonry thing, though, tell me a little bit about your like Masonic history. Like, how did you how did you get into Freemasonry? Well, um, I've always been very interested in, in learning more about improving, about becoming better. And I've had my eye on people that I admire in my real life. And I've, there is a, a, an uncle of mine that I, I really admired growing up. And I thought he was a real stand-up guy, well-educated, very knowledgeable in many fields. And he was very well-liked in, in the community. And one, um, when my grandmother passed, in the funeral, there was a man speaking about my grandmother, how strong she was. They used to know her as the lioness, and they they call the Sepulvedas in 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 my town. They call them the lions. And there's a little master mason nod there uh, for the brothers paying attention. And they used to call her the lioness. This was a very strong woman. Very, she was a leader in in many respects, and. As this man was giving my grandmother accolades and everything, he said, and it, and it shows what great woman she is, that her son, our brother, and he said his name, who you know is a, a master mason and he's a leader of our lodge. And he started speaking very positively about my uncle. And I was taken aback. I'm like, what is this master mason stuff? 
So I became very intrigued at that point. I wanted to know more. What is this about? And of course, I was curious to see if it had anything to do with the positive qualities I perceived in him. Mm. So that's the very beginning of my curiosity with Freemasonry. And, you know, after that, of course, I inquired in several moments, uh, but his response was always, oh, we'll talk later. And he was very discreet. Uh, unlike me, who I'm everywhere in <laughs> on the Internet talking about Masonry, uh, he's very reserved, very discreet. And Freemasonry in Puerto Rico for the longest time was discreet and had to be um, because of uh, persecution and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the naive part of me thought, well, maybe maybe he doesn't think I'm qualified or maybe this is something he can't talk about. And I, I almost saw it as him like giving me a, the runaround for it. But no, he really wanted to talk about it, but in a different setting. So I never followed up with him. And then I came to live in the States in 99. And I started studying about what Freemasonry was. Um, I found your podcast, which is you know part of why it, it is a great privilege for me to be here today. Because I, as a profane, I used to listen to your show. And oh. yes, you had a hand in me seeking light the proper way. Cool. Yeah. Wow. So. That's. Th I, I tell you, that is the that that is the greatest uh, reward that I get out of doing the podcast is when someone says to me, "I became a Mason because of listening to your show." Now, I'm not saying that that's why you became a Mason, but like when when people, I have gotten letters like that, and it it that is like the best feeling in the world, you know. Oh, absolutely. And you know, for me, I've I've received. Uh, letters and, and emails from people talking about what influence I had in, you know, what little influence I might have had in their journey towards light. And I completely understand how, how you feel. But for me, I, I'll tell you even more. The other day I was at my mother-in-law's house mm -hmm. and I was remembering one afternoon, my wife, I think she was a girlfriend at the time. No, no. I think we, we had just gotten married. Um, mother-in-law they all left the house and i stayed there doing some work in the house and i had my buds in listening to ex oriente and it is the program that kept me sane while i waited for a response from my lodge at the time uh i because of course that silence that comes when you submit a petition absolutely and, excruciating isn't that crazy oh my god <laughs> i remember that so well yep so I do remember listening to you and and understanding a little bit more about the process. So that that gave me a little bit of, of peace inside. Well, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad I could help. Oh my god! Um, you did. Wow, that's that's amazing. So, um, so what to you when we talk about practical masonry? Like, what is what does that mean to you? What does practical masonry mean? Well. Practical masonry is being able to look beyond the um, uh, enamorado. It's like that moment of, of that enamored moment in which you're like completely in love with the craft and, and blown away by its mysteries and everything. And you're able to say, how does this fit into my life? Because one thing is to acquire the mysteries and come in contact with the mysteries. And then another is to be proactive in trying to implement those mysteries into your life. Um, of course, you hear all the time that masonry takes good men and makes them better. And one thing that I, I, I repeat a lot, especially my applied Freemasonry program, is that I say it a little bit different is like Freemasonry gives a man the tools to become a great man. He gives a good, a good man, the tools to become a great man. And like any other tool is useless if left unattended, if not used in the proper moments. Uh, but it can be incredibly powerful and useful when you actually employ it at the right time in the right place for the right circumstance. So do you think that there's a, there's a lack of, like I'm, I'm trying to get, I guess, to the, to the need for something like um, applied masonry. Like, is it, is it something where have we lost that sense of practicality? Do you think? 
I wouldn't blanket, you know, I wouldn't say a blanket statement that we've lost it completely mm -hmm. because there, there are lodges that are doing an incredible job at noticing what are the, perhaps the, the rough edges in a man and prescribing to him the proper utilization of those tools. Mm -hmm. I think that there are lodges that are doing an incredible job at that, but many times lodges lose sight of the purpose of actually holding the hand of a man and and helping him through that difficult time in life when he is growing from uh he's coming from darkness to light mm -hmm. and ritual is great memory work uh the esoterics all of these things are, are beautiful but they they can be more effective and more beautiful if placed upon the solid surface of a, of a good Masonic education that has an aim of practicality at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So you, so you created a program, uh, an applied masonry program. So, so how does that work? Okay. Uh, well, before I tell you how it works, I wanted to mention what motivated me to, to create it. Okay. Um, I, my cable toe is very limited. I, I have very, very little ability to go out physically and and go to lodges and speak at lodges. I consider myself to be a a teacher, uh, and I was able to, like you, put a program together and send it out into the ether, and in hopes that someone out there was listening. And granted, we do receive feedback from people, but it's not the same as actually having a face to face conversation with a brother when you see that the lessons are clicking in their mind, when you can see that they, they're they actually getting it, where they can give you an instant feedback of the area of their life that needs that lesson. And so if I was able to go to Lodge frequently, all I would do would be just to to try to be a, a mentor, try to be a, um, a teacher within the Lodge. But my world is almost virtual mm -hmm. here. I have the flexibility of hopping on at nine 30 at night while the kids are sleeping. My wife, you know, is coming back from work or, or doing something. I don't have to be somewhere. Um, I don't have to travel outside of the house. Mm -hmm. And I thought just like me, I wonder if there are other brothers out there who can't go to lodge and actually have that mouth to ear experience with a brother and have that face to face interaction in which there is that instant pushback or that instant feedback that can tailor these lessons to to their lives and to my surprise there were a lot of brothers who who were interested in it so uh to answer your question uh, originally the way it works is i you know brothers sign up for it and i do go through a vetting process considering that i am a member of the grand lodge of uh florida i can only accept brothers that are part of jurisdictions that are in amity with us. So not everybody can be a part of the applied Freemasonry program. And that's, that's just the way it is. I have Cause to, because, because it's tiled. So, yeah. so, uh, how do you like, do you look at a dues card? I mean, what do you, how do you, yes. Okay. Yes. I, I either dues card or they've sat in lodge with me or a brother that I know personally. And since we have a large network of brothers, we can we can um, we can get that kind of validation. But most brothers that are in the program will actually give me current dues cards or a letter of recommendation from their secretary. Mm -hmm. And we've had brothers from from many different countries, uh, all of them, as I said, regular Masons in Amity with the Grand Lodge of Florida. And once they're vetted, I. I we go through a program that it's it's six weeks long mm -hmm. uh, in in the first iteration of the program. And it's a weekly meeting and we have different topics that we we discuss in person. Those who can't join us live because of prior commitments or time differences, they get a chance to the following day, watch the video or download the audio and listen to it. And so do you do it like over hangouts or how do you, how do you No, I use a, uh, I use a teleconference uh, application oh, okay. called Zoom. Uh, I use a lot of different tools, but the main face to face one is, is Zoom. It's kind of like that. Um, um, the Cisco 
go to meeting sort of thing. Right. So I can have up to 20, 25 uh, people in, in the one conversation. And it's not just me trying to preach to them. What I love about the Applied Freemasonry program is that I tell everybody, this has to feel like we're all sitting around a couch having a conversation over a whiskey or some grape juice or whatever uh, favorite beverage you, so, you uh, something in between. Yeah. 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 I give you the, I give you the spectrum and you pick from there. <laughs> um, okay. And so, and so, uh, so each week is a topic and yes. you have a discussion. Are there, is there homework? Are there, we do have, instead of homework, we do, um, we have an accountability program. So mm -hmm. we pair brothers up to through the week and through the months that 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 follow for them to continue following up with their with their progress mm -hmm. we do have a secret facebook group in which only us uh have access and once you are part of the program once you have access to all these assets um pretty much forever uh as long as i'm running the program uh so the the pool of brothers that are available there to help you to mentor you to kind of like push you in the right direction continues to grow mm -hmm. and some of the brothers that supported my program initially now have become very good supporters of the of the program and they help me in mentoring and and you know giving the the lessons and the follow-up and that sort of stuff and so is there an outcome i mean do you get a is there like a, a certification a diploma a lapel pin uh apron uh <laughs> <laughs> not yet uh when we started i want to say a, a year and a half ago i mean not that there needs know. to be i was just curious like if there's it, a if there's an end game it, or is it a continual thing it's always been part of the part of the plan for like for example the ones the brothers that are in in the current class i i call it apply freemasonry one and we will have follow-up uh, we'll have apply for masonry too, and then mm -hmm. I'll find some more creative names for uh, for them. But the idea is that we take a brother and and help him through the different degrees in, in applying all the different uh, lessons of masonry. And the interesting thing is, like, I come in, I come at it with an idea of what's needed. Of course, I get the feedback from the brothers of what is most important to them, and that shapes the the future iterations of the of the program. Mm -hmm. And so, do you like is the are the topics sort of fixed week to week, or do they change? They do change. Um, I have a collection of of topics that we that we do, and I'll change the order or add new ones as. I see the need. Uh, all the brothers fill out a uh, a questionnaire that helps me understand what is important to them, what areas they need help in, so that it's not just us just just talking for the sake of talking. I want to make sure that every time we we say good night from that from that meeting, that they're pumped up and that they're ready to start putting to work the things that they've learned. And I come out with lessons myself. Myself, oh, of course. Um, like no, I, that, that, I mean, that that's the best way to learn something is to teach it for sure. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, what's what what's the reception been like? I mean, how how many how many guys have has, have gone through the program? Um, I want to say close to a hundred brothers have gone through it so far. Um, the interest has been has been good, and I open the window for enrollment periodically. Uh, the onboarding process, of course, as you can imagine, with the vetting and making sure that these people are a good fit. No, it's pretty. It's pretty. Uh, pretty it's arduous. Yeah. yeah. So I open the enrollment. A few people apply. Most of them are able to um, to get accepted because I I try to be very explicit in the application process. You know, don't waste my time if you're not. You know, if you're not a mason. Uh, I say it nicely, nicer than that, but sure always there's always someone who might want to try to do it and i just simply you know let them know that they can't but the reception has been very positive uh many of the brothers that started in the very first class they're really good friends of mine today and which is a 
a great byproduct that I didn't expect. And many of the brothers stay in touch and help and continue to bring value to the rest of the members of the group. And, and it's, it's perfect. Um, because even though I can't go to lodge as often as I would love, I have my group of brothers that meet with me on a regular basis and mm -hmm. help me, you know, square myself. That's great. So let's, uh, let me shift gears for a second out of okay. sort of the applied, uh, Freemasonry, you know, trademark service mark by Juan Sepulveda and, <laughs> and talk a little bit more about, um, sort of the, the idea of, of, of practical Masonry and, and what, like, I'm trying to understand, like, what does that look like? Like, what is it, you know, like I, 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 I'm in agreement with you that like, I think that, 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 you know, part of the, the problem of Freemasonry is that it is a, a really great toolbox, but mm -hmm. it does not provide instruction in the use of those tools. And, and I think that it was easier maybe, uh, you know, 300 years ago, uh, when, when, when masonry emerged from the mists as it were, because men, you know, most, most men were, were, you know, were regular churchgoers. They had a, a solid grounding in sort of, uh, you know, biblical ideas and, you know, many of them either, you know, who were, who would be eligible to become Freemasons were either, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, tradespeople, which means that they had gone through an apprenticeship for, you know, seven years. And, and, uh, and so that, you know, they kind of knew the ropes in terms of behaving, comporting themselves in a necessary way to get by in society. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we have that now. Like, I think it's much more fluid. It's much less, you know, it's, it's much more, um, dependent on where you're from, where you live, what you do, how, how far you're educated. And as a result, it doesn't, you know, like, like the idea of Freemasonry as this thing, it almost doesn't exist because it's just so different. Yeah. You know, let, let, let's let's take for example the entered apprentice degree, and the entered apprentice or the apprentice apprenticeship concept. Mm -hmm. If if you were to ask, do you think that entered apprentices in masonry are treated like apprentices? The answer is most certainly not, because aside from not being allowed into the meetings, there isn't that one-on-one, -on -one, let's work together. Let me see how you're doing it. Actually, that's not how you do it. Let's change this. Try it this way. You don't see that. You see, uh, and of course, I I'm speaking in generalities, but like the brothers that are listening that are from a really good lodge, don't take this personally. This applies to the other 99.9% .9 of lodges. Um, oh, we're in so much trouble now, Juan. <laughs> Uh, so if you think about it that way, Im imagine an actual stone worker um, in the process of, of an apprenticeship. He would be put to the test. He would have someone overlooking his work and perhaps showing him how to better apply the techniques that were taught, as opposed to just having a conversation. And now go to the go to the work site and do what the best you can. And as fast as possible, let's move you to the fellow craft degree or let's move you to the master mason degree or what other other lofty goal. That, that's, that have. that's very interesting. So I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually was educated as an apprentice. Hmm. So I, for, for 26 years, I was a designer and I didn't go to design school. I didn't go to art school. I'm, I'm, you know, I would say self-taught, except that I actually did do an apprenticeship. Nice. And the the way that that happened was, um, uh, I was, um, I I, I'm sort of ashamed to admit this, but I dropped out of school, like I was essentially kicked out of school for grades, right? Because I was mm -hmm. just so bored and just so you know directionless that I was spending all my time playing D Dungeons and Dragons and 
college and not actually attending class. And they finally asked me to leave. Oh, and wow. so they said, they said, look, take a semester, get your, get your act together, come back and you know, we'll talk. So I went home and, um, uh, I was, I'd, I'd already decided that I wanted to be a graphic designer and, uh, my college did not have a class in graphic design, let alone a program in it. So I was looking for another college and that summer was the summer the Macintosh came out. And oh. so when I saw the Macintosh, I was like, it was like the hand of God slapped me upside the head and said, you know, Smitten. yeah, like, just like, uh, and so I started talking to design schools and I would say, you know, what are you guys doing with computers? And they'd be like, nothing, you know, or you can go talk to the guys in the computer science department, you know? And I was just like, mm -hmm. if I go back to college now, it's guaranteed that in five years, whatever I learned in college is not going to apply anymore because it's going to be, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. So I found this guy in a neighboring town who had gotten his uh, uh, education as an apprentice in Belgium. And he ran a program, an apprenticeship program. And I remember when I started that program as a design apprentice, the very first thing that they did was they stuck me in the dark room and I lived in the dark room for three months. Oh, wow. and, and all I did in the dark room was develop photo stats. Now, the, the, again, this is the days really before computers. So mm -hmm. if you had a, a photograph and you wanted to make it smaller, Right. You would take a photostat of it and and that would you would create these things called uh, key lines, which were basically artboards with, you know, type glued down to them and images and stuff like that. And they'd be on a board and then they you'd put the board in front of a camera and then the they would take the film and then they would strip in actual photographs where the placeholder photographs were of the same size. And so you had this enormous camera which is vertical and it had a bellows on it. And so basically all I did all day long was photo stats <laughs> and developing them in this like horrible chemical developer, which I don't even know what it did to my genetics. Right. But, <laughs> but what was interesting is after three months, I had a really good sense of proportion and size. And I could just look at something and know that's, that's a 30% reduction or that's a 60% reduction or something like, you know, that's a, an enlargement of 130%. And I could just instantly know. And the other thing that I would do is um, after the three months in the dark room, uh, in those days, that it, again, that, that it was before computers, no color printers. If you wanted to mock up something in color, you would use these rub downs. And it was like a plastic sheet that had like, you know, letters and stuff. And you you take like a little tool, like a spoon and you just mm -hmm. sort of rub it down and it would transfer mm -hmm. to your paper. Well, the way that you made those is you would, uh, you would mix ink, right? And um, most people, uh, this is going to be like, it's kind of technical, but for, for people who are artists, you know what Pantone is. Absolutely. But right, but Pantone was a, was a recipe system, right? So you would, the number would give you the recipe of how to mix the ink color. And so you'd use these like basic ink colors to, create all the other ink colors. And so what you do is you'd, I'd have to mix these colors and then you'd, you would take this plastic sheet and a, and a steel rod that had wire wrapped around it and you draw down a bead of color and then you'd expose it to film. You'd wash away the stuff that hadn't been exposed and then you put glue on it. And that was what you did. But the oh, thing wow. was, the thing that I had to do is I had to mix these colors and colors like a warm gray color has like 30 different colors in it. Like mm -hmm. people don't know this, right? You, so, but like, I got so good at color that I can look at a color now and I can, I can go, yeah, that's got red in it and it's got purple and it's got, you know, it's got these different pigments in it. And I can tell because I did it over and over and over again until I was sick of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of apprenticeship is that you're doing this like scut work. You're doing this grunt work over and over until it becomes second nature. And only then when you, when you've developed the muscle memory for it, now you can go back and say, Oh, here's why you did it. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like Mr. Miyagi mm -hmm. and the wax on wax off exactly. thing. Right. It's <laughs> like, analogy. you're doing this thing and you're thinking, what the hell am I doing? And then all of a sudden you understand it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, absolutely. We've definitely lost that. We've definitely yeah. lost that. And you know, our, our lives are, 
incredibly complex and the variables that make my life pleasant or unpleasant are completely different than the variables that make yours either of those two uh -huh. and just giving a very vague over the you know like a 10 ten thousand foot level description of what keeping your passions within due bounds is might not be as effective for me as it is for you unless we're actually having a conversation and you can say I almost lost it yesterday after work on my drive home because of this and that and the other. And then we talk about like, why do you think you were so tense leaving work? Is there anything that you could have done then to allow that boundary set by your, your compasses to be tighter in? Is there anything you could have done? And having that back and forth and that sort of conversation helps a, helps a man see the practicality of the compasses. Mm. I remember how blown away I was when I was first uh, brought to light and I saw that gesture showing the circums, uh, circumscribing. Uh, that to me was like, wow, it made a lot of sense. And I started thinking about, wow, that means this for, for me. And I started trying to find how, how does that apply in, in my life? And I wonder how many people see that and instantly try to find how does that fit into my life? Mm -hmm. Like, how could I use that to not be such a jerk on the road or not be so short with my kids or not be so uh, judgmental of the people on the Internet? Like, that's real life. That's the life we're living right now. And it could be very useful and it could be a, a positive change if we actually started putting those lessons to practice in real life. So aside from, so you, so the model that you have is kind of a, it's kind of a, I would almost call it like a Masonic encounter group, or it's almost like Masonic therapy, right? If you think <laughs> yeah. about it, right? You, yeah. you know, it's like group therapy, but in a Masonic context and a Masonic setting, mm -hmm. but if a lodge were to want to do something like this, right? Like how, how could you do it in a way where you can still have a lodge meeting? Like how would a, how, like it, if we were to take this idea of practical masonry and bring mm -hmm. it back into the, into the sort of the generalized curriculum of masonry, mm -hmm. right? How would we do it? Like what, what would that look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I have brothers within the program of Applied Freemasonry that have taken components of it into the lodge. And it looks more, more or less like this. You have your regular meeting that satisfies all the prerequisites that Grand Lodge puts for you. Excuse me. You, you have um, your standard, you know, your state of communications are the same. But you can invite four brothers to your home for brothers that like you perhaps have a full-time job or you find a common denominator that can can make the dynamic uh more useful and you can find maybe five brothers who are parents and you bring them to your house or you meet at a starbucks or you meet you know out in, in a park or somewhere and you choose to have a discussion about just one element of of masonry and i'll give you a, a specific um i'll give you a specific example mm -hmm. uh one of the um one of the i can't call them segments but one of the modules let's say for in applied freemasonry is is called measure twice cut once and it's about the importance of having good measurement of things before we we act upon them and to come back and measure, make sure that our actions were successful. And you still hear me, right? I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Your, your okay. video froze, but, uh, but I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Um, so in, in that, in that module, we talk specifically about things in our lives that we can measure. Let's say our time, caloric intake, our time that we spend sleeping, the time that we spend interacting with other like-minded men, mm 
-hmm. Those are all things that we can measure and we can see how um, how we are in, in our equilibrium. Is there a balance in our life? And then we can take action, concrete action to improve upon that. So let's say a lodge decided to have uh, just for three weeks. It doesn't have to be like a long life, you know, lifelong commitment, but you could have a group of, of brothers who are, let's say, um, retired age. They can come together and talk about one of the tools of masonry or one of the lessons in, in the ritual and, and see how that applies to their life at the stage in which they're in. And if there are any changes that they can make to their lives so that they can increase their happiness, they can perhaps uh, increase their longevity, uh, improve their health, all these different things. And so that's one thing that lodges can do. And I I love that idea, by the way. I, I mean, thank you. So what 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 you're talking about um, is what we in marketing we would call that segmentation right Correct. where you 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 divide your lodge up into got you know like smaller groups of men who are in different life stages maybe they're you know maybe they all work in a similar field mm -hmm. um and then start to say okay how do we apply the principles of masonry these tools to this particular thing that kind of we all have in common. So it could be like parents of young kids, you know, like how to, how does the compasses inform being a better father? Right. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I, am I getting that right? I mean, is that, Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And, and it, the, the reason I don't name the modules by the specific working tools is because none of these tools work in isolation. Mm. And I'm a strong proponent that you learn the purpose of one of the tools, see how you can utilize it, and then see how it harmonizes with other tools in your, in your tool belt. Uh, as an artist, for example, uh, some people might think that all I need is a canvas and some oil, oil colors, mm -hmm. but I need my turpentine or my turpenoid, or I need some liquid, or I need some uh, clove oil. I need some rags and I, I have all these different tools that allow me to express myself in the most precise way. I can materialize the image in my mind as clearly and as I, as cleanly as possible only once I've mastered all these different tools and I can summon them on command as I need them. Hmm. The problem, you know, one of the problems that I see, especially with brothers that, that come in with a lot of zeal and a lot of energy. Um, and it's funny that I say the problem I see with, and then I talk about zeal and, and, and passion. But the problem is that you have this burnout that happens. You have people skimming through some of the most fundamental and important lessons in masonry, and they try to pile on top of that unsteady foundation the most beautiful edifice that mankind has ever created. Mm -hmm. And structurally, it's unsound. Unless there is actual dedication to creating a foundation that is solid enough, then then it's time for you to start building uh, building up and worrying about the beauty of the of the edifice. But that's total my, sense. But that's just my way of thinking. <laughs> All right, hang on one sec. I'm going to see if I can get your video back. Okay. Can you still hear me? I hear you. Eh, it didn't seem to work. Can you can you turn your camera off and on? Sure. Try that. Let me see here. don't think I can. Oh, well. It's a good thing. I mean, like, it's we're, we're just a couple of talking heads anyway, so. Yeah, at least what, my face, I didn't have my eyes closed. That's right. You don't have your eyes closed, and we can, we can, yeah. we can you know, animate your mouth later. Otherwise, we would have shut this down. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, I like I like what you're I like what you're saying. I like I like the idea of of doing that. I like the idea that the tools are not in isolation. Um, uh, and, and you've actually given me an idea. I mean, I, I like the way that this is kind of set up. One of the things that you know um, a lot of Xoriente listeners have have asked me about. You know, they they want to see more. Um, mysticism and Kabbalah and stuff like that. And, uh, that is, uh, to me, it's always, I've always felt like it's better suited to a conversation, Mm -hmm. um, than a show. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. You you know, so, uh, so the idea of having like a, like a, uh, you know, a, a small group of, of, I mean, that's honestly, that's the traditional way you study it anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like you have a small group of people that uh, traditionally you're supposed to, you know, uh, you're supposed to study between the hours of 11 p.m. and midnight. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. It's just it's 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 kind of cool. I mean, you're supposed, you know, like like the, the tradition is, is you, um, you know, you gather together at 11. You're supposed to have a small snack and a um, uh, and, and, a you know, a little a little drink just to kind of fortify yourself uh, as preparation. And then you, and then you, uh, then you start the study and then you go until, you know, until either midnight, you know, like you have to, you're supposed to go at least till midnight and then it could go on, you know, all night if necessary, but you have to stop before daylight. That's good. Um, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, uh, I think, I think that that's a, that's a, a, a great thing. And I, I, I like the idea of, sort of having these sort of outside of lodge um, um, groups or, yeah. you know, like a, like a different kind of uh, curriculum. Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike Hambrick says, uh, we don't need to see Juan. It's just about a spicy voice. Um, <laughs> it's going to be spicy. Uh, yeah, it's going to be spicy. It's nice. So we have a pretty large crowd tonight. Uh, I should just say uh, like Rich, uh, Rich Hansen's here. Um, Mike, the intern, Joe Martinez, uh, Michael Overturf, who, uh, by the way, might be one of your next, uh, participants in, um, in, uh, uh, applied Freemasonry and, uh, We're waiting for you, brother. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, um, there was one comment. So my, Michael said, we have sacrificed the lessons for numbers. Do you think that that's true? Well, you know, here there is a there's a thing to to consider. Of course, lodges aren't free. They have operating expenses. They have overhead, and it is important to to bring people in. And one thing we I think we've lost sight of is the retention component. And if the focus is on having more people and you know, if if you don't plug the 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 bathtub, it doesn't matter how much water you're pouring on that sucker; is is gonna empty out. You know, so part of the retention in a person like me mm-hmm. involves the component of practical masonry. It in, it involves the component of having the conversation that informs me how does it really look to become a better man Mm -hmm. Uh, because otherwise it's just a it's just a slogan it's just lip service how do you make a man a good man better if not by measuring his inefficiencies and working towards improving them and and that is what applied freemasonry is all about it's like how do you measure your flaws recognize them and take steps to improve them okay okay now you so now you've just inspired me to ask a question. But before I do, a couple couple more people just joined us. Uh, uh, John Rourke. I think I've heard of him. He, have you? He's Not a later. he's a good guy. Um, and then uh, my good friend Adahan, who's he's a, a member of my uh, lodge uh, and a great Mason in his own right, has uh, has joined in. Hello, guys. Um, so let me ask you a question. So when we talk about making good men better, mm-hmm. and it's funny, it's it's. It's funny that it's not, this question's never occurred to me before. Who's responsible for that? The Who's individual. responsible? You think so? Oh my God, yes. And, and he, here's here's the thing. 
it is like that whole that proverbial you can take a, a horse to water but you can't make them drink it, it it it's innate from the individual just as he as he's made a mason first in in his in his own heart without the interaction of of any other masons it is imperative on that individual to improve himself in masonry okay and uh-huh so here's where I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. And, and, and this, right. it's funny because like Jason and I have this, we have this conversation all the time because we always say we have to find things to disagree about because we agree about so much and we're like, love it. It's good radio when you have a disagreement. He always says that. It's good radio. <laughs> it's good radio. So, so here's, here's, here's why I disagree. If that were true, then uh-huh. the individual wouldn't need Freemasonry because what we uh-huh. say is Freemasonry makes good men better. Right. And if it's, if it's the responsibility of the individual, then it's uh-huh. not then it's not Freemasonry that's doing that. But here's here's the 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 difference is the responsibility of the individual not by himself. And yesterday we were talking about this. Is like we have grown isolated from everyone else mm-hmm. from a physical uh, point of view with all the social media and how busy our lives are and how many things we're involved in and and we tend to isolate ourselves from the influence of others. The desire is born in you and is your responsibility to seek it, but it doesn't happen in isolation. Um, like I am very independent. I'm very um, independent. There's no other word for it. Like I like doing things by myself and I've recognized that that puts limitations on me. There's just so far that I can go just by myself. But the desire is born from from within me. So I'm responsible for seeking that interaction with other people, putting people together to help me uh, step up to the next level. Um, but it, it it's not... It's not just me. It's mm-hmm. going to be a group effort. And the way Freemasonry does that is by putting you in contact with all, all these other like-minded individuals. The problem is if you occupy that time discussing what's, you know, who's going to take care of the ice maker and, like, why are so many raffle tickets, you know, unsold. Right. As, as Pete no Norman would it. say, spaghetti dinners on paper plates. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's yeah. Exactly. Which are important, but they can't be the the bulk of the of the Masonic experience. So, so let me let me throw an idea at you, and you tell me what you think of this. I think it's the individual's responsibility to be a good man and to be a better man, but it's the lodge's responsibility to make good men better. L- let's see. Um, <laughs> I have to think about that because. It's almost like it's my responsibility. I, imagine how if if I go and this is 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 what's happening. People come in expecting them to be the 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 Play-Doh that Freemasonry comes and molds, and when that doesn't happen, they just fizzle out into some other organization or to no organization whatsoever, and expecting that external hand to do something upon you i don't think it's the i don't think it's the right approach i think what masonry's role can be as an organization is to not just put the tools in that man's hand uh but kind of like tell him how he can put them to use in his life to become that better man okay so here so i'm gonna get philosophical with you for a second so so think about your own kid Mm-hmm. Right. Whose responsibility is it to educate your kid? It is mine. Okay. And if your kid, like you send your kid to school and your the teacher's kid calls you up and says, uh, you know, Mr. Sepulveda, um, look, I really hate to say this, but, you know, your kid is uh, – He's uh, misbehaving in class. He doesn't really pay attention. Uh, he's having really a hard, really hard time in math, right? What you're saying is that it would be your responsibility to sort of, you know, f- find other ways to engage him, 
right? Your kid to find other ways to, 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 you know, in other words, you would feel obligated to, 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 to fix that problem. Yeah. Right. You wouldn't just say, well, you know, it's, eh, what are you going to do kids? You know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're going to, you're going to kind of take that seriously. And yes. And, and why? Right. Because you love your kid and because you know better. Mm-hmm. Right. The reason I say that the lodge is responsible is because as brothers, we love each other. And as brothers who are Freemasons who are maybe more advanced, maybe we're past masters, maybe we're master masons and we're instructing our apprentices, we know better. And so Mm -hmm. we can show them the tools, right? But if they're not, uh, if they're not getting it, and this is why I like your, this is why I really liked your suggestion from before about dividing people up into different groups and sort of, and sort of applying that, overlay that sort of that that the you know the the tools and the lectures overlay into sort of what they're about at that moment in time that's a that's an Mm -hmm. alternative way of engaging them i think that lodges have a responsibility that if if you know like it's not enough that we just sort of show them the tools and then and then send them home right and then just say right and it's funny because we're getting comments now like so uh adahan says um you know, we as Freemasons show light to whom wants to see it and help guide uh, whoever, whoever, whomever willing to ac- is willing to accept it. Right. And uh, and then Michael uh, Overturf says, you get out of masonry put what you put into it. Um, uh, and he said, Midnight Freemason Darian uh, El Sade said something. Uh, uh, Darian El Sade, something so awesome. Uh, ba, 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 ba. why do we set the bar so low? Love that. Right. Mm. And so I, I just feel like, like we're letting ourselves off the hook. Mm-hmm. If we take the trouble to vet somebody, I mean, think about it, like think about it from this perspective. So like, let's say that a guy joins uh, uh, applied masonry, right? He, he pays his fee. He, he gets vetted. He gets into the program and it's clear he's not, able he's not understanding what you're talking about he's not able to engage don't you as an instructor like feel obligated to sort of try to figure out another way to engage him to to a degree um he here's he, here's a if we if we continue the analogy that you had about the kid going to school uh-huh. um expecting masonry to be a stronger hand in actually making that individual learn. Um, Think of that kid as a teenager who will have more influence upon him. The kid that's sitting next to him, that's his age. That is, has his same life experience and got it and actually tells him actually what, what she meant was this, like, look, look in my notebook here. Ah, now I get it. As opposed to, because you have that rebellion of the of that individual, like how many old people, you know, tell the young person, "Don't do this, don't do the other," and it doesn't matter how many times they tell them. It takes that young individual. It's up to him to take the right step or the wrong step. Learns the lesson either way, either by the wisdom of following the advice or by the. A misfortune of of not listening and stumbling uh, on his own, but it ends up being his responsibility. Um, it 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 would be interesting to to keep on um, thinking about like what the lodge could do. But most of the brothers that I've seen that actually get it and really are able to get the best benefit, they want to be better. You know, it's not just, well, yes. Yeah. And it, it, it's not a, I don't think it's a zero sum game. Like, I don't think it's all mm-hmm. or nothing. I don't th- like when I say that, I think the lodge is responsible for making a good man better. Um, I, what I, what I don't mean is that that does not absolve the individual from any responsibility. Right. I so see. like what I say to my kid, you know, so I have a teenager and what I say to him, he's, he's finishing up high school is I say, you know, your primary job is to be a good student, is to get good grades. Mm-hmm. That's your job. Now, if you suck at your job, you need to get better at your job. 
because you're going to mm-hmm. be you're going to be going into the real world where you don't have a whole cadre of teachers that are like you know there to you know pick you up when you fall and stuff like that they'll just tell you mm-hmm. you're fired get out you know and and so my job as your father is to make sure that you're you have the resources and opportunities and the 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 way in and the thing is it's like if one way doesn't work i'm obligated to find another way and and Mm -hmm. and you know what what uh you know what i've what you know my wife and i we've talked about this a lot you know we said look this is a situation where you work the problem right we're designers this is what we do we work you know we're problem solvers we work the problem so i think i think that that the lodge is responsible for making a good man better what the what the individual man is responsible for is being part of the lodge mm. right and and of and of 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 being a stakeholder and a contributor and stuff like that but that's the instant you know it's sort of like if if i as a um if i were a university right and i was training uh doctors medical doctors and i did a crap job of training medical doctors um i have a responsibility to teach good medicine Right. Mm-hmm. That's my responsibility as a school. Um, some people may learn it better than others. Right. But it do- that doesn't mean that I'm not responsible for doing my best to make the best doctor I can make. Absolutely. Right. And so Absolutely. that's that's yeah. kind of like and, that, and 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 I think what you've what you've opened my eyes to is sort of that idea that um, it's not enough to just, you know, it's like you would never like if you think about a degree, like, like an attainment, right? Like, you know, I, like I have a, a, have a master's degree, worked really hard for it, really proud of it. But that master's degree would mean nothing if they just sort of said, you know, here, here's a bunch of frameworks and tools. Uh, uh, congratulations. You're, a, you're a master of design. Yeah. You know, absolutely. it wouldn't mean you, anything. You do have a point. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And, and here what's missing is, it's almost like many lodges are trailing behind. It's a race to try to help these men become better, but they're bogged down by all this other minutia that like adds nothing to that man's uh, improvement. Like what? And, what? Give me an example of what you mean. Well, for example, financial troubles in, in lodge, and you have you know people fighting for fighting against a ten percent increase in dues, and like the lodge actually needs a one hundred percent increase in dues. And like all all this administrative uh, uh, barrier that many lodges face, especially those who are facing closure, because I mean they have to shut down their doors because they're not they're not solvent. And if if we are able to look at all the moving parts and try to little by little improve upon all of them. Because as we mentioned earlier, we have r- recruitment and, you know, some people cringe at using that word, but let's just use it for what it is. It's like the, that onboarding process of bringing a, a good man into the fraternity. Mm-hmm. So you pay attention to recruitment that is done efficiently, that no scoundrel comes through the, the West Gate. And you, work, you worry about retention, making sure that the individual that comes in is getting what he came in looking for. Um, I, I do remember, you know, early on, my idea of what happened behind that closed door was night and day compared to what I expected. Uh, what was it reality? It was it. It was, and I expected. Well, maybe next meeting is that. That's the meeting that they'll have a little bit more of this meat and potatoes, and then I find myself in the same Groundhog Day, and and every every meeting it continued to be the same and then it was time to practice for a new degree bring some new people in and you see all these people coming in and having the expectation of uh, of these lofty discussions and these real deep discussions into how to become that mythical better man and instead what you see is a rush through degrees and an eventual exit into the higher degrees of masonry and I think that in its essence is part of what's preventing a lot of good men to follow through and become better at the end. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, I try as best as I can through all the outlets that I practice masonry in to provide that which I might have missed. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that maybe this brother couldn't make it to Lodge, but he can listen to the Masonic Roundtable on his way to work and get really excited about really bringing balance to his life or really being charitable and in, in putting to practice all these things that that makes that make our fraternity such a such a great organization. So hopefully there's a brother out there driving that's listening to this and gets pumped up and puts together five brothers and does his own little version of apply for masonry in lodge next week. Yeah, I think I think we should all think about how we might bring that into our lodge. I know that um uh I'll I'll be bringing something like this to to lodge and uh, uh, I will talk Adahan's ear off about it. But but uh, <laughs> um, but one thing that I think is important is how we set expectations among men in lodge. And this is almost kind of veering off into a different subject. But mm -hmm. one of the things that's kind of interesting is is um, I love being on investigation committee, yes. and when I you know sit down. Uh, I always try to like scare people a, just a little bit, but not in the, you know, Ooh, you're going to ride the goat way, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. um, more, more like, uh, more by saying to them, you know, like asking them, you know, why do you want to become a Mason and don't tell me, you know, because you're a good person, mm -hmm. right? That's not a reason why. And, uh, that usually like stops them dead in their tracks because that's what was on the, you know, about to f tumble out of their mouth. And then what I explained to them is I said, look, what masonry is, is an opportunity to work. That really, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not going to get anything out of masonry. You're going to earn stuff in masonry, but you're not going to really get anything out of masonry. Right. What you'll, what you'll, what you'll get is the opportunity to, to, to work and improve yourself. And, and you'll have like a, a support system to help you get better at it. Right. And, and if that's what you're looking for, then you'll find it in masonry. And if you're not looking for that, you know, if you think you're going to get something, you're going to get some ancient knowledge or you're going to get some secret wisdom or you're going to, yeah. you know, get a network of, you know, whatever. Right. You're not going to you're not going to find that there. Yeah. Yeah. Setting setting expectations is is important. Um, it's like um, I think it was Wayne Dyer that he used to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change and is like setting that expectation of what is behind closed doors and masonry. What can I expect from it? And like I tell people, especially when they come in and they have that first wind uh, in masonry and they're able to span their wings and, and catch it, I, I tell them capitalize on that excitement and make this experience what you want it to be. Like stop just uh you know complaining or feeling sorry about yourself or oh i picked the wrong lodge it's like how do you want this experience to look for yourself yeah it, it, like just ask start moving start taking steps to make that vision a reality because no one's going to come and give it to you no one's going to come in and give you an answer to your petition from a limo without a license plate and you know written in parchment like that's not going to happen and, you know, we have these romantic ideas of what our organizations like ours are. Yeah. And unless we have a more realistic expectation, we are bound to be disappointed. Right. And I think from a, from a logist perspective, you know, all you all you guys who are in your in your officer line, you know, understand that that entered apprentice the day after he's been initiated you will never get a Mason more enthusiastic, yep. more excited, more ready to work than that guy at that moment. And if you don't take advantage of it, you're crazy. You're absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. Right? That first blush of Mason where the guy is like, it's, he, it's, it's all imagination. He's not part of those horrible, you know, cold spaghetti dinners on paper plate kind of <laughs> meetings. He's not paying bills. He's not arguing about dues increases. None of that stuff. He hasn't gone through that yet. He's still in the the magical blush of of that powerful emotional degree experience. Put that to work. 
please. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and on top of on putting it to work, imagine if every lodge took that new apprentice or let's say the 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 the, the youngest master mason, right? Mm -hmm. And ask them privately, what is the biggest challenge you're facing in your life right now? And then finding if there is any way that the tools of masonry can help alleviate that resistance. Could you imagine the impact that would have on that man's uh, life? Yeah. If, they, if their answer is, well, respect in, in, at work, or they tell you uh, that they always go to bed angry because their kids are not going to bed in time, and or they're rushing out of the house in the morning, or they feel tired all the time. Regardless of the answer, there is likely to be a tool in masonry that is going to help that man make adjustments and improve his life instantly. And that's an opportunity we're allowing to pass us by. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And that's a so great, there's a challenge. That's a great, it's a great place to, this hour has just flown by. Yeah. Uh, Juan, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Please come back. Oh, it's an honor. Oh, it is my um, pleasure. Anytime. And, uh, uh, I want to thank everybody who showed up in the, uh, the sizable crowd. You know, we may have to just switch to Thursday nights going, going forward. Oh, there you um, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll have to talk to Jason when he gets back. Uh, but thanks everybody for, uh, who, who showed up in the, um, for the, for the live broadcast. Um, and, uh, especially thank you to our, um, uh, executive producers without your support and your help uh this show would not be possible um we encourage everybody to become an executive producer uh you can do that at our patreon page it's patreon.com forward slash x uh you can leave a uh, a small monthly pledge and you'll uh you'll be uh counted as part of the uh, x oriente uh, uh elite and um and if I do do this Kabbalah course, which I think I'm going to do, I think I have to just figure out how to, how to do it and when, uh, th that'll be, that'll be, a uh, uh, open, um, uh, to, to all, the, uh, all the, uh, executive producers, um, uh, automatically. Um, and, uh, let's see, let us know what you think of the show. Let us know what your thoughts are. You can contact us at uh, xoriente at gmail.com. Or leave a message on our Facebook page uh, at uh, facebook.com forward slash xoriente. Uh, thank you again um, for uh, for coming. And um, uh, I think we're going to do the, the next uh, broadcast is going to be April 8th. And we're scheduled to have Brother Chris Hodap on. Really? So uh, that'll that this should be fun. So you won't want to miss that. Um Anyway, uh, take care, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, uh, oh, and uh, listen, uh, if, the, if this is your first time hearing Ex Oriente, subscribe to Ex Oriente. You can do that through uh, uh, the uh, Apple uh, uh, podcasting app or uh, wherever you get uh, fine podcasts. Um, you can also get the show at our uh, website, www.exoriente.com. We uh, also... Um, post the video uh, usually the day after to our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can always uh, you can always watch the video here on Facebook. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, we'll see you next time.